Hi guys, um, so I'm Claire, I'm one of the neonatal consultants at the Homerton. Um, just thought I'd do something a bit different. So we're gonna go through some x-rays and then each x-ray there are some specific learning points. Um, for each x-ray, if you can pop in the chat any answers to the questions and then we'll go through it. And if there's any issues with the slides not moving as it's been a little bit of a technical challenge, um, if someone could just unmute and let me know so that I don't carry on blindly um, with the slides because the way I've had to do it, I can't see the chat when I'm looking at my screen. So um, to start with, we're gonna go through how to interpret x-rays. And then the x-rays I've picked are either spot diagnoses or short cases, um, they're all real life. Um, and then as I said, we're gonna highlight learning points to cover um, various topics within neonates. Uh, a quick disclaimer, I'm not a radiologist at all, um, but these are all real life since I've been a consultant at the Homerton over the last three years. Um, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Prakash, also gave me some of these x-rays. So this is just to familiarise everyone. I'm sure you know this, um, but obviously check we've got the right patient and the right exam. We want to make sure that it's adequately penetrated. We can see what we want to see in terms of exposure and that it's not rotated. And when we go through some of the line positions later, the importance of not being rotated will be clear. And then as we do in medicine, the easiest way to think about x-rays is A, B, C, D, E. So A is airway and lungs. B is the bones. In particular, look for fractures and bone density. It's really common to have a clavicle fracture on an x-ray that's missed because we've done the x-ray for chest reasons and we're not looking at the bones. And the same for bone density and rib fractures. It's just important to consciously look at those. C is the heart, so looking at the heart border, um, the size, cardiothoracic ratio, and obviously if the shape is unusual. Although I will tell you that the textbook answers for things like boot-shaped heart um, are not as clear cut in real life. D is the diaphragm, and you want to check it's continuous on both sides and check that you don't see any free air. And E is everything else. And by that, I mean lines that you've put in, whether the markers are there, so left and right, and also whether there's anything else on there that should or shouldn't be. For example, if you've left the cooling mattress on and that's given you the artifact appearance. So each of the x-rays is gonna be like this. I'll give you a short history. And then if you can pop in the chat the answers once I show you the x-ray. Um, and don't worry about being right or wrong. A lot of these x-rays um, flummox um, a lot of the team and that's why we've used them. So this is a ventilated preterm baby. Uh, the team had put lines in routinely, and this is just an abdominal x-ray to check the line position of the umbilical lines. So this is the x-ray. Um, and if you want to tell me what you see on this x-ray, if you pop it into the chat, hopefully I'm now going to see the chat. Now I've changed areas. So we're having to think about whether the lines are okay and what else you can see on the x-ray or if everything is fine. Have a pop an answer in the chat about what you think about the x-ray and the lines. Well done for the team that are starting to answer. I'm very impressed that you guys um, have noticed the chest signs straight away because this was missed by the team on. Um, so yeah, this is the UVC for those of you less familiar and that's okay, it's just below the diaphragm. And this is the UAC, but it's short. So if this is T12, L1, L2, so it's L3. So it's a low UAC that comes with its own risks. It's much higher risk of thrombosis. So most people would remove it unless you were desperate for it because the optimal position is T6 to T9. But the more worrying thing is here and what a couple of you have put on the chat is a left-sided pneumothorax that could easily be missed because you're doing this x-ray to look for the lines. Um, so yeah, it was a left-sided pneumothorax, UVC, low UAC and an NG tube. Um, so we need to look at a chest x-ray to look at the pneumothorax and obviously check how the baby is. Risk benefit of a low UAC, generally avoid unless your baby's needing lots of inotropes. And the learning point for this one to start with is just to look at all areas of the x-ray, not just what you ordered it for. And out of interest, that's what the chest x-ray showed. Um, so it was a left tension pneumothorax because the heart's been pushed over. And so the baby did require urgent needling and then drain. 
So this one, you've got a 34 week old baby um, who, 34 weeks gestation, sorry, baby, just been born. It's an infant of a diabetic mother, was intubated on labor ward because of increased work of breathing. And then was started on inotropes once the central line had been put in. And so they started on dopamine, uh, was on dopamine of about 15 mics per kilo per minute with no real improvement in the blood pressure. And there was poor cardiac contractility on the echo. And this is their x-ray. So again, if you have a look at it, um, and then if you pop your answers in the chat, this is a real life case for me. Um, this is before I became a consultant actually, but it's a good one, so I'm sharing it. Is a baby who I transferred from one hospital to another when I was on an NTS job. Um, what do you think about this x-ray? And there might be several things on the x-ray. Um, so just pop in the chat what you notice on the x-ray and don't worry about being right or wrong. Um, it's just important to start looking at all the various things we can see on these x-rays. Yeah, so um, Katie's put, if that's a UVC, it looks odd, uh, and query effusion. Uh, and then we've got a couple of others saying UVC is unusual and effusions. Okay, let's go through this one. So I've put on some arrows for you to highlight what we're looking at. So this one is, yeah, the UVC is very odd. Um, it's on the left, isn't it? And the IVC is on the right of the body. So that's definitely an odd course. This arrow is to highlight that this is what ascites looks like on an X-ray. So you see that the abdomen looks slightly bulged and it's all fluid and you can see very little abdominal gap. And yet, as you guys had said, there's an effusion here and there's also an effusion on this side as well. So we've got bilateral pleural effusions, effusions ascites, um, and whether it's a misplaced UVC because it lies to the left of the spine. So we took the UVC out and sighted a long line and in the meantime gave peripheral dopamine and the effusions were drained. Uh, and the effusions had a very high glucose content because it was coming straight from the high glucose that the baby was receiving through the UVC because they were an infant of a diabetic mother, they had hyperglycemia and so we're needing a very high strength. And so if you just go back to this x-ray, you should never see a UVC on the left of the spine. And although this one has a slightly kink here, which might raise suspicions, we literally had another one of these last week where it went straight into the body here and then rose up really nicely and was in a perfect position, but it was on the left of the spine. And that is an abnormal course and it should be removed and it will, will extravasate. And so when you're checking the position of a UVC, as well as the level, make sure you look at whether it's on the left or the right and you want the IVC is on the right of the spine. Therefore, your umbilical catheter must ascend on the right for venous and the aorta should be on the left. Well done for those of you that noticed the effusions. So this one, um, so there was a 25 weeker who's on CPAP after initial brief ventilation and was given surfactant. And the nurse on has just noticed that she's getting recurrent blood stained aspirates from the OGT. Uh, the OGT is from birth and the baby's now day three of life. There's a slight increase in lactate and base deficit. The lactate's gone from one to 3.6 and the base deficit from minus one to minus five. And actually the baby would have an increasing oxygen requirement and they've just decided to intubate and re-ventilate the baby. What do we think of this one? Again, pop it on the chat for me. Just going back to the previous one, sorry, Alison, because I could just see your comment. Um, it's a good thought to think about a CCAM for um, that weird x-ray. It's because there was so much going on. Um, and actually, it was effusions, which are very difficult to tell on an x-ray. And if you're ever unsure about what something is, particularly whether it's fluid or not, an ultrasound um, is the best way to help confirm fluid in a baby for an effusion. 
Uh, and for this current one, we've got ET Long, yep, and we've got NG somewhere. Yes, good comment, Katie. Any advances on where we think that NG might be? Um, so we've got NG going to the right, but stomach bubble visible. Uh, on the wrong side, query perforation. Yeah, well done, team. So let's look at this one. So what we've got is the NG tube is going to the right. And I'm just going to show you with my mouse, because I believe you can see it, is occasionally you can put an NG tube and it go into the lung but you can see the carina here. So if it was gonna go into the lung, it would follow here to be going in the right main bronchus. So it's not gone into the lung, it's gone below the diaphragm, and we know we've not got situs inversus because the stomach is here. So that raises the suspicion of perforation. And then we've also got this mediastinal air here, which also raises the suspicion of perforation. And so what you need to do is nil by mouth, um, start antibiotics, and you need to take the NG tube out and you can't put a new one in to allow healing of the perforation. If you want to confirm the perforation, if you're not sure, and you want to know exactly where the NG tube is, then you would do a lateral decubitus. And you need to discuss with the surgeons if you're not already in a surgical center. And normally they need between seven and 10 days nil by mouth and antibiotics. And this baby here had 10 days nil by mouth and 10 days without an NG tube. Um, so just remember as well that they may be at risk of having increasing abdominal distension, which may compromise their ventilation because you're unable to aspirate the, the stomach for the time that they're not allowed an NG tube. Well done with that one. So this one, the 27 week baby who was growth restricted born with a birth weight of 650 grams was ventilated and was started on uh, TPN via a UBC because they knew it would take a long time to start feeds. And then they got to day five, and so a long line was cited in order to remove the UBC because they had noticed some periumbilical flare. What do we think of this one? Again, pop it on the chat for me. Uh, and yes, Neha, sorry, I only just seen your, they do heal without surgical input for the esophageal perforations, as long as you leave it long enough without trying to put another NG tube down. Uh, so we've got one answer for uh, UBC query extravasated, long line too short, and then biliary tree air. So if we go and have a look, um, yeah, so this UBC is a bit odd, and then there's air here, and then, yeah, the long line is short. So it depends on where you work as to whether they would say that's okay or not, and also how urgent the long line was. Ideally, you want to see it coming down here, heading towards the right atrium, some units would be happy with it being in the right atrium. Some would want it outside of the heart border. So always check where you work. But this is definitely short. And if you left it in, need to make sure everyone knows to monitor around the chest and shoulder for signs of extravasation. But yeah, so there's gas query in the liver. Is it a liver abscess? Um, and so you need to do a liver ultrasound. And if you're treating for sepsis, we need to make sure that we cover for liver abscess as well. And you may want to think about doing a lateral decubitus x-ray to rule out pneumoperitoneum. So this is not typical of pneumoperitoneum because it's very isolated in a small circle. But no one could say for definite that that wasn't free air. So you should consider a lateral decubitus when you're unsure. Um, and that baby had a liver ultrasound. And it was felt to be a liver abscess that was felt to be from a malcited mal UBC. But it completely resolved after seven days of IV antibiotics. Next one, you might have some guesses from the history. Um, so it's a late preterm infant, 35 plus six weeks, who had been asked to see for tachypnea on the postnatal ward. And actually when you speak to mum, she said that she finds the baby's almost choking when attempting to feed. So the things to think about when you look at this X-ray is what's the diagnosis? Is there anything you'd look for in the antenatal history? Anything else you'd look for? And what your management would be? So that's the X-ray. And then if you know the diagnosis, what um, would be the antenatal history? What other things would you look for in the baby? And what's your management? 
Yeah, well done. So Neha, very hot off the mark. So we've got a coiled NG tube. So just in case you haven't seen it, if it's not projecting very well, the NG tube comes down here and then coils back on itself. So we're suspecting esophageal atresia and we've got gas in the stomach. So there must be a fistula. And so if you make that the diagnosis, is there anything in the history that would support that antenatally? Yep, yeah, we've got polyhydramnios. And so what are you going to do with this baby on the postnatal ward that you've now got that x-ray of? Yep, yeah, we're going to admit to NICU. And then just think about all the standard things you do for essentially a surgical baby that you can't feed. So you're going to have to put them nil by mouth, IV fluids and IV antibiotics. And you need to examine them closely. So it's atresia with a fistula because you've got air in the stomach. And as you guys said, antenatal history is polyhydramnios and they may also comment on a small or absent stomach. And the learning point for this is it's a really typical postnatal presentation. And I just want to highlight it because we actually had a missed case um, a couple of weeks ago where the baby was reviewed for poor feeding, uh, was breastfeeding, so you couldn't quantify the amount they were taking. But actually, midwife and parents felt that the feeding was getting better. They hadn't lost a substantial amount of weight, normal exam, normal saturations, and so I was discharged home and then re-presented with ongoing respiratory distress and then started regurgitating feed and was diagnosed with this. So important when you're reviewing any baby with tachypnea or respiratory distress is specifically ask about how the feeding is going in terms of level of regurgitation, particularly if the milk's completely unchanged, whether they're choking or coughing with feeds. Typically, they might have excessive secretions. And then obviously, when you try to advance an NG, it generally won't go beyond 10 centimetres. And you may see abdominal distension with a fistula because the air will go through the fistula into the stomach. Although I will say in real life, um, it's actually quite difficult to get to see that abdominal distension, but it is important to think about it. And then things you want to look for when you diagnose that is it can be associated with atresias anywhere in the GI tract, and in particular an imperforate anus. So when you see that x-ray and you admit the baby, make sure we're doing the knife but in particular checking for a perforate anus. And then the two main associations are vactoral. So you want to look for vertebral anomalies because they sometimes have hemivertebrae that you can see on your chest x-ray. Anal, so check for imperforate anus. Cardiac, you'll be listening for a murmur, but also they would have an echo. Jaquil, esophageal, renal and limb anomalies. So these babies would also get um, renal ultrasounds. And the other one is charge syndrome. So they get coloboma of the eye. Same thing, look for a murmur and an echo for congenital heart disease. They can also have atresia of the nasal coronae. They would be small when you plot their um, weight, length and head circumference. And they can be associated with the genital anomalies and ear anomalies. So when you admit these babies, it is important that you're looking for these associations. This next one, this is a spot diagnosis. So this is for a condition that you might commonly see in the lungs of a baby on a neonatal unit. What do we think this one is? You would normally obviously have some sort of history for the baby, but if you were given this image, this is a particular textbook image of this condition, that we see commonly in the neonatal unit. What do we think it is? Yeah, RDS, well done. And then the reason why this is RDS is small volume lungs, um, homogeneous ground glass opacity and air bronchograms. And just when you're thinking about what this ground glass opacity actually looks like, it's this general uniform haziness throughout the lung and you can see these air bronchograms. And depending on the severity of the RDS depends on how homogeneous this is. So the lungs might look completely white or there might be more areas of aeration. The next one, this is a 24 week gestation baby who's now six weeks old, so approaching 30 weeks corrected. Um, is ventilator dependent on some parental nutrition and building up feeds. They've been a lot stopped starting with feeds um, due to abdominal concerns. And then today they've had worsening blood gases and an increasing oxygen requirement. Therefore, an X-ray was done. 
what do you think about this diagnosis and anything you might do? Um, for those of you that don't know or haven't seen this, this is just a PDA clip. And again, this is an x-ray that we had. Um, so they're all real life, which is why they're not perfectly centered. Um, they're not kind of typical images you might see in a textbook. But what do we think is going on with this one? If you were the registrar on call for this baby, you've been asked to review them because of increasing oxygen requirement, and that's the x-ray you get. What do you think? So we've got lots of votes for collapse consolidation on the right. Um, and we've also got small lungs, abdominal distension and paucity of gas. Yeah, so if we have a look, um, this is the ET tube. It's definitely long because it's abutting the carina here. And that's most probably causing collapse consolidation of this right side, most likely more collapse because of the fact that you're not going to be getting any air into this right side. But what you guys didn't see, is the football sign over the abdomen. So I'll go back to the x-ray in a minute, but you were completely right with the low ET tube, the right upper lobe collapse consolidation, PDA closure clip, and the NG tube and long line. So I'm gonna go back to the original x-ray before I show you. And if you just stand back from your computer screen, I'm gonna draw around it with the mouse, but it is here. And it's really subtle and is a real life example. And it is particularly missed because there is lung pathology. So you've done an X-ray for increasing oxygen requirement. You see a problem on the lungs and therefore it's very easy to miss this. Um, and abdominal perforations that present with a football sign are very easy to miss on X-ray. So it's really important to look for them. And if you do see it, you're obviously gonna go no by mouth, IV fluids, IV antibiotics. You want to check what the lactate is and you'd want a lateral decubitus film to confirm it. So again, just to highlight for you, this is me trying to draw around the football and this is the original x-ray again. So it's here and it definitely helps in real life to stand back and look at the x-ray from a little bit further away to see it. And when we did the lateral decubitus x-ray, so this is the liver, you shouldn't see free air here and there's a lot of free air. So that's confirming the perforation. Just going to check there's no questions on that one no okay so i would say this is one of the biggest learning points once you've seen the football sign once um you will start looking for it much more in other x-rays and what may help you if you're unsure is on your x-rays if you reverse the black and white sometimes it's easier to see this football sign as well this one this is a 36 week gestation baby delivered by elective section because sadly the parents had had a previous neonatal death with GBS sepsis. Was intubated at birth because although it wasn't particularly tachypneic or working hard, um, at five minutes of life remained hypoxic with saturations of 60 to 70%. They gave surfactant on labor ward, no real change, and then admitted the baby to NICU where we started high frequency. And again, the SATs probably only increased to the 70s. What do we think of this X-ray? What's your working diagnosis at the moment? And are there any particular investigations you would like to do based on that history? Again, pop it in the chat for me. This is another real life example, typical on call was a three o'clock in the morning X-ray and a super sick baby. What do we think of these lungs? What might it be? Sorry, Alison. So Alison just said she missed the history. So to go back to so 36 week at elective section, previous history of GBS in another baby that had sadly caused them to die. And this baby was hypoxic despite um, surfactant and uh, high intensive care. So we've got one vote for TAPVD. Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna go through it. 
Um, so it's really good to think about cardiac and think about TAPVD, but remember common things are common. So first thing is that we've got bilateral opacities throughout the lung fields that obscure the diaphragm and some of the heart border. So you can't really see the diaphragm here or here, and some of the heart border is obscured. And remember what we said about checking for everything. We've got an ET tube that's okay, but a UVC that is bending over towards the left, so is malpositioned. And the differential diagnosis in that would be sepsis, um, particularly GBS pneumonia. So GBS pneumonia looks like RDS on an X-ray. If you have a term baby in particular, or late preterm, that when you do the X-ray looks like really severe RDS, particularly if there is a sepsis risk factors or setup for infection, then think about whether that is GBS pneumonia, because that is really commonly how it presents. And then as Ali said, you want to think about cardiac. So you've almost maximised your neonatal intensive care, and the baby remains severely hypoxic, so cardiac's got to be up there. And then obviously RDS, but it would be very severe at this gestation to be causing this level of hypoxia. And just bear in mind the history of neonatal death, although it was felt to be GBS sepsis, this should increase your suspicion about any cardiac or metabolic causes. So what we want to be doing is looking for why the baby might still be hypoxic. So pre and postductal SATs, obviously you're going to start antibiotics, an echo if you can, and you want to try and see what the arterial PO2 is in 100% oxygen. So as well as can the SATs increase on the monitor, do you actually get an appreciable change in your arterial oxygenation? And you want to discuss with the cardiology team RE transfer. And then this question, Ali has already got to because she got to TAPVD, so well done. Um, but TAPVD classically looks like that. And the way you'll see it described in the textbooks is a snowman in a snowstorm. And if we just go back to that, I mean, I'm not sure that really looks like a snowman here and then a snowstorm. So I want you, what I want you to take away from this is that a baby whose x-ray looks like severe RDS, who's not responding to maximal treatment, number one is that infection with the most likely being GBS. And number two, think cardiac. And the typical cardiac condition that presents like this is TAPVD. And if you're particularly interested, and I've just put a link here um, that gives you uh, really good pictures of TAPVD. But your main learning points is think about it when particularly if you're struggling with oxygenation. And one of the other clues for TAPVD is that the PO2 from a UVC um, will be significantly higher from a UAC. And that's what happened in this case and what helped with the diagnosis. So really well done for those of you that thought of cardiac. And even if you didn't think of cardiac, the next time you see an X-ray like that, just have that on your radar for a baby that's not responding. So this is another spot diagnosis. So a typical X-ray, again, for a baby admitted to the neonatal unit, what do we think that one is? Um, and I'm just going to plug my computer in, so apologies if you can see me moving. <laughs> This one is a term baby, if that helps. So think about your common respiratory conditions that affect term babies on NICU. Yeah, okay, we've got one vote in for meconium aspiration and a couple more coming now. Yes, so this is typical for meconium aspiration. And the reason it's typical is you've got coarse infiltrates bilaterally. And I used to always wonder what these things meant when it was described as coarse, but I hope you can appreciate compared to the RDS X-ray, these generally look bigger and a bit more defined, and that's what they mean by coarse infiltrates. And it's a bit more patchy than RDS. So you've got some areas of aerated lung and some areas where you've got that homogeneous um, opaque areas. You get widespread consolidation, generally hyperinflated. You may get pleural effusions, and typically you'll see pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. So if you think about what meconium aspiration does, you're essentially getting meconium drawn into the airways that can obstruct it and cause air trapping. It can cause a chemical pneumonitis and also it can inactivate any surfactant that the baby has. So predisposing the lungs to becoming much less compliant. And these babies typically need quite high ventilation and that's why they might um, predispose to getting pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. Next one. So we've got a 24-weeker. He's now four weeks of life. 
was well grown and um, was doing really well with feeds, had got to full enteral feeds within two weeks of life and was on CPAP, was actually in minimal oxygen, about 25%, but actually today it's been increasing to 40%, noticing increasing desaturations, the lactate's rising to four and they're having bilious aspirates. So you may well have in your head what you suspect this diagnosis might be. And if you do, does this x-ray help you? And if you don't, what do you think about this x-ray? And again, if you pop it on the chat for me. Yeah, we've already got one vote for neck. And yes, Bolla, you're right. There was a right-sided pneumothorax on the previous one. So I think that history generally predisposes you to think that the baby's got neck. But when you start working in neonates more, you we do so many x-rays for babies that are not tolerating feed. And there's a lot of x-rays that are borderline and aren't clearly NEC. So it's about really focusing in on what we can see on the x-ray. So if we go to this one, yeah, you're all right. And this is grossly dilated. And if you want to know how you define dilated, you pick one of the lumbar vertebrae and the diameter here, if the bowel width is larger than that, then that's dilated. And clearly this is about two to three times. So we've definitely got dilated bowel. And then some of you in the chat have also said portal venous gas and pneumatosis. So you can see here that if you imagine the biliary tree and what that looks like within the liver, when you get air within it, it looks a bit like a roadmap within the liver. So yep, we've got air here. And then pneumatosis is this magic mottling term that you might hear us use a lot. And mottling can sometimes just be what feces looks like. So if you look here, this is mottling, sometimes described as soap bubbling. It's also here and it's also here. And the ones here that kind of look within a bowel loop could just be feces. But these ones that kind of are venturing outside of a bowel wall make it more suspicious for pneumatosis. So yeah, this x-ray neck, uh, and you picked up all the signs, really well done. And you guys all know this, we make the babies know our mouth, IV fluids, IV antibiotics. And if you can, you want to upsize the tube to as large an NG as possible and put on free drainage. And remember that baby's on CPAP. So most likely you're gonna need to intubate them because you don't want to worsen the abdominal distension. And with an x-ray like that, they're probably gonna be in pain and therefore gonna need morphine as pain relief. And one of my big tips for you is when you get bowel loops that are this dilated, it is almost impossible to tell if you've had a um, perforation. So when you have really significant bowel dilatation, you should do a lateral decubitus to rule out free air because you can get caught out with it. And then just to go through some of the neck findings that you're looking for, um, as I said, a supine x-ray is the mainstay. But if you're suspecting a perforation either clinically because the lactate's gone really high, really poor handling, or really dilated loops of bowel, then you need to do a lateral decubitus. You may get dilated bowel loops. You can get a bowel wall edema with thumb printing, pneumatosis and portal venal gas, which you all saw. And then the pneumoperitoneum can present uh, in lots of ways. So you may see air under the diaphragm. You may see that football sign that we went through earlier. And you can get something called Wrigler's sign, which again, I've put a link to if you've not seen that before, where you get air on both sides of the bowel. And you can also get air outlining the falciform ligament. But only 50 to 75% with proven perforation have visible free gas. So the flip side to that is that 25 to 50% won't. And then just for those of you that may not have seen as many neck x-rays, um, these are just some that we've had recently. Uh, so this is more of the pneumatosis that I was talking about. And here, and here. This is a really good example of pneumatosis within the bowel wall, because it's outlining here. And then the falciform ligament being outlined is this bit here, if you've not seen that before. And I think these x-rays are very clear that it's NEC. But when you work in neonates, you will see that there are a lot of x-rays that are very borderline where there's not such clear cut pneumatosis and people are unclear. So they put query mottling. So just having a specific kind of checklist of what you're looking for um, in your abdominal x-rays would be important. And so for these two less dilated loops of bowel, I'm less concerned about perforation. This one, these two loops are particularly 
dilated, as is this one. And this is very odd. So I would do a lateral decubitus on this baby, and that baby did have a perforation. Just going to check there are no questions before I go to the next one. Thank you, Katie, for linking that. Um, so the next one, this is a 32-weeker who was just admitted to NICU um, because of respiratory distress syndrome. Mum had only had one dose of steroids and baby had increased work of breathing and oxygen requirement uh, and was having a couple of apneas. So it's intubated uh, and they did an abdominal x-ray for line position. What else do you see on the abdominal x-ray? And again, this is something else that would be easily missed. So number one, we've done it for lines. But what else can we see on the x-ray? Have a, have a look and then pop your answers in the chat for me. So we've got one suggestion of ephemeral fracture, which is great that we're looking at bones. I think you probably mean this bit, um, Katie. It's not a fracture, but well done for looking at it in a spotter. It's actually just the vascular line of the femoral bone. Um, that isn't why I've shown this x-ray, but well done for looking at bones. Anyone else spot anything on this x-ray that is a little bit unusual? And this was missed. And the reason I'm highlighting these is because they are the sorts of things uh, that are very easy for us to see. So yeah, Bola has highlighted that the UVC is going on the left. It is, but this is where rotation is important. So this is probably a very rotated x-ray. One leg is here and one is here but yes you would be worried about that UVC and so you would need to repeat the x-ray with the baby completely straight to check whether it was a malpositioned UVC or right well done for remembering that it shouldn't be on the left but there is something else on this x-ray yes well done Neha um, so if we look back and this is why it's subtle can you see here that there is some opacification underneath the left diaphragm and there's also a couple of dots here and it's really subtle. Um, so obviously the x-ray showed the lines that we spoke about, but there are also those two areas of calcification. So if you didn't see them here and here, and that means that it's a suspected antenatal perforation. And abdominal cal x-ray calcification seen at birth is actually more common than you think when you start looking for it. And it's due to calcified meconium that's present in the peritoneal cavity, and it means an antenatal perforation. And you could have a perforation antenatally for lots of things, but the three most commonest are whether there's an underlying bowel atresia, antenatal volvulus, or a meconium eyelids. So this baby needs to get to a surgical unit, and you need to keep them nil by mouth on IV fluids or TPN. Um, and we need to particularly look out for CF, so cystic fibrosis, in these babies. For this baby, it was rather unfortunate because they were transferred to us, so I work in a medical level three, so we accepted them for uplifted care as a standard preterm infant needing um, ventilation. And then that was the x-ray on admission. And we had to transfer out to a surgical unit because of this antenatal perforation. However, the baby never needed any surgery. The bowel healed on its own. And after two weeks of bowel rest, uh, feeds were cautiously reintroduced at the surgical unit. And the baby came back to us and did well. Um, but this is where it's important just when you do your x-rays to look for this. And sometimes in hindsight, you might do um, grand rounds or you might be looking back at a case of a baby that's having repeated feed intolerance. And it's often the standard preterm baby where we're really struggling to start feed. But just look at these x-rays and are there any areas of calcification? And are we struggling to start feeds because it's preterm uh, and slower transition? Is there an ileus? Is there a stricture or previous neck? Or is it that they've had that antenatal perforation? And you will see if you go back closely in a lot of these cases that there may have been an antenatal perforation. So this one, there's a 36 weeker on NICU um, who was admitted because of hypoglycemia and was poor feeding. And then actually we really struggled to start feed. And whenever they fed the baby, it was having really large vomits. And they tried different formulas thinking it was that because the baby was otherwise well um, and no change. And then actually, when they looked at the charts, they realized the baby hadn't opened their bowels since birth. And it was day four of life. What do we think of that one? Again, if you pop your answers in the chat when you've had a look at it.
So again, think of yourself as the reg on call. You've done this because of vomiting, which as you all know, is a really common presentation, both on NICU and the postnatal ward. And then that's the X-ray you see. If you're unfamiliar with something, this here is just the cord, the clamp on the cord getting in the way. I know that can catch people out the first time you see it. So we've got votes for duodenal latresia, no air in the rectum, and stomach bubble unusual. Yeah, well done, guys. So most importantly, no air in the rectum, which is concerning for a baby who's day four and hasn't opened their bowels. And we've definitely got a lack of bowel gas after a certain point. So we've definitely got stomach, probably duodenum, and then whether or not there is any part of the jejunum or not. So yeah, you're right. Um, there is no bowel gas past a certain point. This was actually jejunal atresia, but for those of you that said duodenal atresia, well done. It's very difficult to distinguish between the two on x-ray. Uh, and same actions as you do for most surgical conditions. Fill by mouth, IV fluids, IV antibiotics, and discuss with surgeons. Um, this baby went on to have a surgical repair and did very well. This one, so we're on the last couple now. This is a 35-week uh, new admission to NICU. Um, due to their weight. Uh, sorry, there's missed off. It was 1.6 kilos. There was some work of breathing, so it was intubated at birth, given Curacef, and a UAC and UVC was cited. As is common, we do these x rays just to look for line positions. And what do we think about this one? Um, so I want to know about the lines, which is the reason why we did the x ray, but I also want to know what else is wrong with the x ray. Yep, well done, Shani. So we've got one vote for something that I won't say out loud just in case some of you are still thinking about it. But also, what do you think about those lines? So remember, for all of these x rays, even if you see a pathology somewhere, there could be something else going wrong. Don't forget there was that football sign in a baby with right upper lobe consolidation. Yep. Lovely. So when we look at this, the UVC is probably OK. Um, so finishing just about level with the diaphragm and is on the right hand side. But what we assume was the UAC has definitely coiled in on itself. And then we've got an ET tube that's up here, so probably a tiny bit high. And then we've got an NG tube that's coming down. It does kind of go below the diaphragm and then comes back up into the left side of the chest. And then when we look at this left side, this is the left diaphragm that's been pushed up and then you've got bowel that's going from the tummy and is going above into the thorax so well done for those of you that said it so we've got um a congenital diaphragmatic hernia or the differential is a left eventration of the diaphragm which may be more likely for two reasons one the diaphragm is almost continuous whereas in a diaphragmatic hernia you tend to obviously have a gap in the diaphragm and that's why the bowel's gone up Whereas this looks more like the bowel is staying beneath the diaphragm, but the whole diaphragm has risen up into the hemithorax. And although this baby is intubated, they're relatively well. Um, whereas babies with diaphragmatic hernias would expect to be more unwell. But the caveat to that is babies who have undiagnosed diaphragmatic hernias tend to have occurred later because they haven't been picked up on the antenatal scans. And therefore, there's been less time with the bowel in the thorax and less time for it to have an impact on both the ipsilateral and contralateral lung. So they may well be presenting not as sick as you would expect. But either way, you do nil by mouth, IV fluids and IV antibiotics. In this case, the baby was already intubated, but if you'd done this X-ray before intubating, you'd want to avoid CPAP because it descends the bowel. And you'd want to discuss with the surgeons um, about whether it is a simple eventration or whether we think it's congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Where I work, this baby would be transferred over to the surgeons. And if we're thinking about congenital diaphragmatic hernia, we need to make sure we're on top of looking for the associated problems, particularly PPHM, so persistent pulmonary hypertension. So we need to make sure we're checking pre and postdoctoral saturations, looking at the arterial oxygenation if we get a UAC in, and making sure we've got an adequate systemic blood pressure. Um, and this is just another example of where when you're called to review babies on the postnatal ward, particularly, 
um, for uh, respiratory distress or you admit a baby into NICU for respiratory distress, sometimes x-ray miraculously are super quick and they come and you may not have placed the NG tube down. Now on that x-ray, I'm sure you still would have seen the fact that the left hemidiaphragm was eventrated, but things like esophageal atresias or diaphragmatic hernias or eventrations can be missed without the help of an NG tube, particularly if the hernial or eventration is subtle. So just remembering to get the nurses to um, kindly cite an NG tube as soon as you have a new admission, so that all admitting x-rays have an NG tube in, that will help you come up with the diagnoses. I think this is the last one. Uh, so this is a spot diagnosis. What do we think of this one? It's a few years old now, but the first time I saw it in real life, I didn't really believe it looked like that. What do we think about that one? If I help you out and say that the baby looks a bit dysmorphic. <clears throat> think they're a bit floppy. Yeah, well done, double bubble. So I can see why some of you have said abdominal mass, um, which number one, it's a good thing that A, it's, we know this x-ray is abnormal, right? Um, but can we clearly see that there is a stomach bubble here, an NG tube that is going probably still into the stomach, but a bit low, and then another bubble here, and they appear to be completely separate. And that is your double bubble presentation. And this is probably one of the few x-rays that the one you see in typical x-rays describing it is what you will see in real life. Um, and the reason you get it is you get the stomach is distended. So you get air filling that to give you this first bubble. But then the duodenum has a blind ending pouch, which means you get the second one. And typically it's associated with trisomy 21. So you would look for this in babies where you've got confirmed Down syndrome, but also vice versa. If you get an x-ray looking like that, then you would want to check that the baby doesn't look dysmorphic. And it can also be associated with antenatal polyhydramnios, as can any of the gut atresias, because they're less able to swallow the amniotic fluid. And so what I hope these x-rays have shown um, is that if you use that ABCD approach, then we're not going to miss the pneumoperitoneum on an x-ray that has lung pathology in it. We're not going to miss the calcification in the abdomen on a baby who we've done uh, x-ray just to check the lines on. And just remember, however quick and busy you are, and we're all guilty of this, is that you're asked to review an x-ray for line position, particularly if you're the night shift and the day shift of put lines in and then you're asked to review it. Just make sure that you go through your A, B, C, D, E. And even if you have in your mind what the diagnosis would be, like those of you that had automatically thought about neck for the baby with bilious distension increasing GSATs, or for those of you that had thought about cardiac and TAPVD very early on, is make sure that your x-ray justifies that and helps you reach that conclusion and don't jump to a diagnosis and miss more common things. So keeping that logical approach would help. And then the spot diagnoses that we went through is just to highlight that in neonates in particular, pattern recognition is key. Every x-ray practically of RDS looks very similar. Every x-ray of meconium aspiration looks very similar. And so getting used to what you expect to see in common conditions um, can really help you with the diagnoses. I know it's quite difficult on here, um, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat or um, put your hand up for me. Uh, and Bola, yes, the NG tube does have, oh, it's gone mad, um, a bit of a kink in it. Sorry, I'm just going back to it badly, it seems, um, this one. And that's just because um, of the double bubble. So probably this is still stomach, even though it looks a bit weird. But I agree, it does look a bit abnormal, which might be why some of you were querying an abdominal mass as well. Thank you very much for those of you that joined. I hope it was useful to do something a bit different. Um, if you have any questions or anything,